Hi, this is Pastor Joel Webbin with Right Response Ministries, and you're listening to another episode of our show called Questions. Today's question is this. What does Pastor Joel Webbin think about slavery? What does Pastor Joel Webbin think about slavery? To flesh the question out a bit more, we have this. Pastor Joel recently came under fire for some comments he made about slavery in American history. Some people made it seem as though Pastor Joel actually defends the history of slavery in America because Americans bought slaves instead of kidnapping them. So what does Pastor Joel actually think about this particular issue? Thanks for asking. Great question. So for those of you who are not aware of what this is referencing, um, I did an episode a while back um, with A.D. Robles, on our podcast called Theology Applied, where we did a defense of Doug Wilson. And, um, and I just talked about how one of the things I appreciate about Doug Wilson a lot is, um, well, he says this. He says, the Christian should have no problem verses, meaning there should be no verse in the Bible that the Christian is ashamed of, that they're embarrassed of, um, that they don't have some kind of answer to. And if they don't have a high intellectual answer, in some cases, that might be for the better, right? Because sometimes a Christian doesn't have a problem verse, um, but the reason why it's not a problem verse for them is because in their pseudo-intellectualism, they actually nuance the verse into saying something that it doesn't actually even say. So the reason the verse isn't a problem for them is because they're actually twisting the verse, not because they, they can resolve the tension, not because they have an answer for the verse, but because they've actually changed the verse. And Doug Wilson is basically just saying, you know, no Christian should have any problem verses, not because they're uh, able to not be ashamed of this portion of Scripture because they actually twist the Scripture, no, Uh, but because they know what God's Word means when he says this, and if they don't know, if they don't have a high intellectual um, answer, response for Exodus chapter 21 or whatever it might be, you know, some of the the things that the Bible says about slavery or some of the things that the Bible says about um, husbands and wives, um, then at the end of the day, they still have no shame. That they're able to look at the person, the opposition, the person who's heckling them, the person who's pressing on them and say, let God be true and every man a liar, right? In other words, the best way to be on the right side of history is to believe the Bible. It's only a matter of time. God's word ultimately always proves to be true. Not some of it, not most of it, not just the New Testament, all of it. And so, all that being said, I made a comment on that episode of Defense of Doug Wilson where I said, you know, one of the things that a lot of Christians used to, you know, or or are embarrassed of, one of the texts or one of the topics in Scripture that Christians are ashamed of is slavery. And I said, I used to be embarrassed. I didn't know what to do with some of these texts about slavery. And I said, it's so freeing. It is so freeing to not be embarrassed about this any longer, to not be ashamed. And the problem is that I said this comment in passing because it wasn't the main point of the episode and we moved on to talk about other things with Doug Wilson and our defense of him and those kinds of things. And really, you know, if you're going to talk about slavery, you probably need to be more intentional and dedicate a little bit more time because it is a hot button issue, especially in our culture today with the woke. And so you need to be able to provide the necessary context and explain what you mean, to explain what you mean. And so the comment that I made is I said, well, you know, the founders, right, our our civil fathers in America, it's not as though they were hopping on ships and sailing across the Atlantic and going into the bush of Africa with, you know, human-sized nets and casting them on people and kidnapping them, dragging them back onto their ships and then taking them over and exploiting them as slaves. No, we didn't go over and steal people. We went over and bought people. And, you know, the backlash came. And, well, how is that any better? And uh, buying people is kidnapping, and that is what God's law is talking about. And the reason I brought it up is because you know the Bible the Bible condemns some specific things regarding slavery. Um, one, you know, I, the Bible would condemn a race based slavery. So part of the problem with the African slave trade is the fact that it was race based, right? That um, 
If you're black, you're a slave. If you're white, you're free. Now, to be fair, part of the reason why all slaves were black is because of the place predominantly where Americans were buying their slaves, which were African nations. But I would say that, that still, nonetheless, a system of slavery that enslaves people solely on the basis of race, one, one ethnicity is slave, property, and another ethnicity, by virtue of their ethnicity alone, is free. Um, that, I believe, is counter to the word of God. I believe that that is sin. I think that, that it, uh, there's lots of verses that we could quote, and James, and mul multiple things. That's, that's prejudice. It's showing favoritism um, based on off of arbitrary outward factors. Okay, so race-based slavery. I think that's wrong. Um, and I think the Bible would condemn that. Um, slavery that would separate families. Okay, that would separate uh, a husband from his wife, father from his children, a mother from her children. Um, I believe that that's wrong. In biblical terms, if a man went in to slavery, already married with a wife, then whenever he was freed, um, his wife would go out with him. Now, if he chose to marry in his slavery, right, he came in single, fell in love with a female slave, and chose to marry her, then if his term ended before hers, he didn't get to take her with him. Um, but in American slavery, as it was, there are multiple cases of separating husbands from mothers who were married before they even went into slavery. And even for the man who went in single to slavery, in biblical terms, Exodus 21, married in a state of slavery, um, when his term was up, if his term was up before hers, he would have the option, if his master was a good master, to remain a slave in order to keep his wife in order for the family unit to not be broken up, right? Now, in terms of the African slave trade, um, you have, it's not just that you have people going into slavery, you know, being purchased as slaves, as single. Um, no, you have people going in married or going in with children and the slave trade breaking up whole families. And that is a problem. I, I believe that that is sin, according to the word of God. So race-based, uh, breaking up the family. Um, Lifelong slavery, right? That you're born a slave, you'll always be a slave, and there's no ability to, um, to purchase your own freedom. Now, in some cases, there were in, in American slavery, right? Some masters were not cruel to their slaves, and some masters did. Um, there were abilities for slaves to earn their freedom. There were free black men at a certain point in America before simply um, the results of the Civil War and the abolishment of slavery. Um, but there were also many cases where masters were abusive to their slaves, physically abusive. Um, they were not treating their slaves, as Ephesians 6 would say, when Paul talks about the master-slave relationship and the master should recognize that they too have a master who is in heaven, um, and that they should therefore deal gently and fairly with their slaves as Christ is gentle and kind towards us. So there's, there's abusive, ruling abusively over the slave, uh, the race-based prejudice of a race-based slavery, uh, a lifelong slavery that offers no hope, and uh, the wrongful, unjust, sinful breakdown of the family unit. I believe that all these are things that I would disagree with the African slave trade. Now that said, um, you know, here's the thing, and you know, people aren't going to like this, but I, I need to say it. Some of you need to hear this. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, who owned slaves was probably 10 times more godly than you are. I'll say that again, right? Because you, you don't like it, and so you probably need to hear it twice. Jonathan Edwards, who owned slaves, was probably 10 times more righteous and godly than you are, and me, and me. I'll include myself. I, I'm not going to even begin to claim to be more sanctified and more righteous than Jonathan Edwards. And Jonathan Edwards owned slaves. But from every document and every report of Jonathan Edwards and the way that he treated his slaves, he honored them. He treated them respectfully. He did not physically abuse them. He followed what the scripture would say in Ephesians 6 with slavery. And I understand here, people say, well, the, the, like, slavery is bad, period. Joel, what is wrong with you? 
You should have already been done answering this question. Just slavery is wrong. I believe that the underlining principles of the gospel and the whole counsel of God were always intended to lend towards the absolute abolishment of slavery. Why? Because we believe in the gospel of free grace, which produces free men, which produce free markets and free prosperity and flourishing. All the, So we believe in the gospel of freedom. And not only that, right? It's law and gospel, law and gospel. Well, we also believe in the law, according to James, of liberty. So not just the gospel of free grace, but also the law of liberty, the law of freedom. And so, yes, I do believe that the, the, the underlining principles of the whole of Scripture, both in the gospel of God and the law of God, ultimately, when, when consistently applied, make it impossible for someone to own slaves. In an ultimate sense, I think that the Bible did exactly, exactly what it was supposed to do in Western cultures, Western nations. It led towards the abolishing of slavery. Now, I do think that there are several other Western nations that were able to abolish slavery due to biblical principles that were designed by God to do precisely that. And yet they were able to do it without the blood of 650,000 of their sons dying in a civil war. I don't think that we needed to have a civil war. I think that Abraham Lincoln, from what I've read and things that he has said, was a race hustler. I think Abraham Lincoln was a white supremacist because he said very clearly racist things about black people, that they were inherently inferior to the white man. I think Abraham Lincoln flew a flag of abolishing slavery in order to do what he really wanted, which was to centralize power away from the states, the federal government. So I'm not a big fan of the Civil War, but that doesn't mean I'm a fan of slavery. I'm not a big fan of Abraham Lincoln, um, but I do think that it was right to abolish slavery. I don't know if America did it the right way, but I definitely think it was right to abolish slavery. I believe that the Bible lends towards the abolishing of slavery, but here's the thing. There's a difference in the Bible having general principles, the free gospel of grace that creates free men and the law of liberty that protects, that protects men from being the property of someone else. I think there's a difference in those general principles working towards, right? Like a little leaven working through the whole batch of dough, right? The mustard seed growing into the large tree. I think there's a difference in, in the overarching weight of scripture eventually working out slavery and helping people come to see it as something that is ultimately atrocious and wrong. I think that that is different than looking at an individual like Jonathan Edwards or some of the founders in our nation, like Jefferson, and saying this individual was heinously wicked because of slavery, because they own slaves. And if they own slaves, that's the end of the discussion. Story over. I don't care what they did for God. I don't care how many times they preached. I don't care if they helped to found you know, one of the, the, the greatest nations in human history that is, has ultimately been a force, an imperial global force for benevolence. Yes, there's been bad things, but those bad things, I believe, are ultimately the bugs rather than the features and that the founding principles of this nation have lent towards prosperity and protection and life and liberty, not only for our nation, but globally across the world. But it doesn't matter what Jefferson did and it doesn't matter what Edwards did for the gospel and his preaching and his writing and all these things philosophically, uh, theologically. At the end of the day, these men owned slaves. End of story. Close the book. They're dirtbags, right? Tear down their statues. Rip up their books. If you're a Reformed theologian and you've got Jonathan Edwards' books on your shelf, shame on you. That's what, that's what I'm not willing to do. I'm not going to do that. I'm not. I think the overarching principles of Scripture were always intended to produce a society where every man was free. I believe that. And certainly not a slavery that was race-based. Certainly not a slavery that was uh, demolishing the family unit. 
those kinds of things. And certainly one of the biggest, most heinous crimes in biblical terms was kidnapping. But my point on that episode with A.D. Robles, it got a little bit of limelight, got me in trouble some, and I'm sure this will too, and that's okay. But my point was, if we're going to condemn America, right, if we're going to rewrite history, 1619 Project, you know, and really America, you know, wasn't built on principles of freedom, it was built on the backs of slaves and all that, okay, if we're going to do that, I just think we need to be consistent. I just think we need to be fair. I don't think we should do that. But, but if you're going to do that, then, then you, you've got to hate. You've got to hate. If you hate, I mean, AOC, Alexander Ocasio-Cortez, she hates America. Liberals hate America. They're not patriots. They don't even want you to fly an American flag on the 4th of July. They hate America. And all I'm saying is you need to be consistent. And if you hate, and they do, hate America, you got to hate African nations. That's my point. Because Americans went over there and bought people. And we can argue till we're blue in the face about all the things that are wrong about that. And I'd probably agree with you nine out of 10 of your points. But if that's wrong, and I believe it is, but if that's wrong, then, then how do you defend tribe warring against tribe and the victors then enslaving the losers, and then selling them to Americans who come in their ships across the Atlantic. How do you defend that? Right. So if we're going to say America is this force of evil and it's the, the, the original sin is being a, a white American, white, right? white colonialism and imperialism and all these kinds of things. Look, everybody who owns any piece of land currently Ultimately, and when I say not individual people necessarily, but like in terms of cultures, nations, they, they got it by beating someone else, right? So it's like, well, America, you know, took the land from, you know, Native Americans, indigenous people who were here before we, yeah, uh-huh, and, and where do they get it, right? This, this, this <laughs> Native American tribe beat this other tribe. See, Amer what America did really was this imperialistic, we're, we're going to come in, we're going to beat you, we're going to take you. America did what every single nation and culture has ever done. South America, African nations, Asian, everywhere. White Western civilization is not, it does not hold a monopoly on evil. That, that's what I'm disagreeing with. I would just argue that, that, that what America has done is what every other culture and group of people has always done. We just did it well. So you can't, I mean, if you're going to be honest, intellectually honest, you cannot be angry and say that America has done something uniquely heinous, that other ethnicities, cultures, nations have never had the audacity to do themselves. No, America has done exactly what everyone else has done. We just did it better. And once we did do it, take over, take the land, build, establish, all that, we eventually came to our senses and realized that it was immoral. And we undid some things. And then became a force globally. That, that expedited some things that were wrong, but also a lot of good. I mean, you can look at the statistics. No other nation on earth has been as generous and benevolent as the United States of America. And we can say at a political level that we disagree, we disagree with imperialism. But I think it really comes down to what, you know, Rush Dooney said, it's not whether but which. If America is not a global empire, I'm pretty sure China is going to be real happy to take that slot. And if it's not China, Russia, or whatever, somebody, the world that we now live in, we don't live in an isolated world. We live with airplanes and submarines and the internet and technology and where it can FaceTime someone on the other side of the planet. Like the world that we now live in is a smaller world. It is a global world. Nobody really has the luxury of, of the isolationist you know, way of life. And so we're all globally connected. We're all going... 
and somebody's going to fill the slot. Somebody is going to be a superpower. Somebody is going to hold other nations in check. Somebody, you know, someone's going to be the leader of the free world, right? And I would like it to be America. Because even though I think America has fallen, fallen a great deal from her former glory, I still think America is one of the last bastions of freedom and benevolence and kindness and goodness and prosperity on earth. And so, yeah, I'd rather America win. I'd rather America be that global empire I, than anyone else. So everybody took land. Everybody you know, one tribe beat this tribe. One nation went to war with that nation. Everybody, everybody did that. Everyone did that. White Western culture is not unique in that regard. If anything, we're unique in the sense that we were more successful and by God's grace, we had the sense that ultimately came from our founding documents that were derived from biblical principles, we had the sense to work out the bugs and then try to hold on to the features. And what we see from critical race theorists and social justicians and woke culture and intersectionality and all this kind of stuff today is a horrible reversal of trying to go back in America's history and its founding principles and work out the features and keep all the bugs. And yeah, I'm not for that. So I am pro-American. The Gospel Coalition would call me a, uh, a nationalist. That's fine. I would say I'm just patriotic. I love my nation. I don't love my nation more than God. I don't love my nation more than my wife. I don't love my nation more than my kids. I don't even know if I love uh, my nation more, more than I love a good night's rest on my, my king-size mattress. <laughs> I think I, I might love my bed more than I love my nation. But, but I do love my I don't hate America. Sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian who is patriotic, who's grateful to God for this nation, who wants to fight for this nation, I don't believe America is the hope of the world. I believe the church is the hope of the world. But I do believe that God in his providence has used America. And if he would be so kind, I would like him to continue to use America. And I don't think that America is worth giving up on. And I'm willing to point out America's flaws, but I'm not going to rewrite history and act like America is the, the, the source of, of original sin and that whiteness is the source of original sin. So yeah, so I'm not, I'm not embarrassed. I'm not embarrassed by our nation. I'm not embarrassed by its history. But most importantly, hear me, I'm not embarrassed by the Bible. I'm not embarrassed by Exodus chapter 21. I'm not embarrassed even by texts that say that a master could beat his slave with a rod so long as it wasn't bigger around than his thumb and so long as he did not kill the slave. For the slave is his property, says the word of God. That's a tough verse. I'm not saying it's my favorite verse in the Bible. What I am saying is let God be true. And every woke, squishy, professing Christian from the gospel coalition, a liar. Let God be true and every man a liar. And when I have a problem with any piece of the word of God, the problem isn't rooted in God, it's in me. Either I'm not understanding something, or, or I just think I'm more ethical than God. And I think that's what it really is. See, because I think there's a lot of squishy professing Christians right now that would say, well, well, we're not ashamed of the word of God either. We're ashamed of your interpretation of the word of God, that you would actually think that God's word would say that, that a man could own slaves so long as he ruled them righteously, like Jonathan Edwards did, and that you would call that man godly. That's what we're ashamed of. We're not ashamed of the word of God, Joel. We're ashamed of you and your interpretation of the word of God. And I would just say, I don't think that I'm wrongly interpret interpreting the word of God. I, I, don't, I don't think that I am putting words in God's mouth. 
I think the person who's doing the exegetical gymnastics to try to, to, try to make it seem as though there is, there is nothing in Scripture that would allow for slavery. Right? There's nothing. I think that's the person who's ashamed of the word of God. They're the one who, who, is saying, who is saying, God needs to be apologized for. Or God needs to be explained. They're there, God. Let me, let me explain what you mean. I think that person, they either think that they're more ethical, right? That they're more benevolent than God. They're better than God, more moral than God. Or they think that they're wiser than God. Like, I know God is ethical. I know he's moral. I know he's holy. But gosh, he just says things poorly sometimes. You know, inspiration <laughs> with the scripture, the Holy Spirit inspiring man. You know, it just doesn't always work out. Sometimes a little bit too much man gets in there, like in the case of Exodus 21. And so, you know, I, I need to get in there and, and explain to people what God means. Because he can't mean that. And I just want to leave the possibility open that maybe the Bible means exactly what it sounds like it means. Maybe God means to say exactly what it seems like he said. And that I'm neither wiser than God, nor am I more moral than God. And the fact that I don't like a particular verse, or I don't think it's ethical, or I don't think it's the wisest, most careful way to say something, maybe that just has something to do with me. And maybe it says nothing about a problem with God. So my default position is always going to be, whether it's verses in the Bible about slavery, whether it's verses in the Bible about patriarchy, which I'll throw that one, you know, since we're on a roll here, might as well go ahead and say that I'm, I hold to biblical patriarchy as well, not just complementarianism, because complementarianism is pretty squishy, especially these days, but biblical patriarchy. I do believe, is, is the model. So whether it be verses about patriarchy, whether it be verses about slavery, whether it be verses about homosexuality, which, you know, the word that we should use is, I believe, sodomy. Um, that's what the Bible would, would say. And all these topics, all these arenas, my default position is, let God be true and every man a liar. Thanks for tuning in. As a special thank you for your gift of any amount, we'll be happy to send you a free digital book from our store. To access this offer, visit rightresponseministries.com offer. We highly recommend Pastor Joel's book, Am I Truly Saved? If you or someone you know has wrestled with doubts about the love of God, this would be a great resource. As a reminder, to get this offer, go to rightresponseministries.com offer. And thank you for your generous support.